on the source code for the tutorials. So I uh, for the assignment. So the assignment 3D is due tomorrow at class. The general approach is as follows for the assignments as well as the course project. Source code is never required unless explicitly asked for. So in the assignment, question two, I think is the only one that asks to hand in the source code. You don't need to show me your source code. However, if your question is wrong, if your plot is incorrect, you will get zero grades. There's nothing else to go on. You have the wrong plot, there's nothing else to grade. If you hand in source code, we will try to look at it and find the problem, but not guarantee that, because you can imagine with 90 people in the class, it's hard to debug source code, especially printed versions of source code. It's normally hard to debug. I can, I can debug electronic copies of it, but not uh, printed versions. So the, the policy is this. If you hand in source code printed, the TAs will try to find your problem. No guarantee, but you will probably get at least some partial grades for it. Whereas if you choose to not hand in any code, there'll be no grades. And that, that's for the project as well. Let's just talk about the project. A few people have been asking about it. So the project was initially due on the 27th of March. I know that you have another project that due that day. So I decided to bump my project just one extra day on to the 28th. I know it's not that much to help you out, but it's, um, I can't bump it up further than that because then we start going into exams. And there's, in fact, I think one of your other courses, 3G, has a midterm the next day anyway. So there's no sense in bumping it too far. The 28th of March will be the project. The project will be probably along the following lines. I'll set it tonight or tomorrow. I'll probably set it tomorrow. It will be something along the lines of designing a, plug, uh, a packed bed reactor. The equations that you'll have to model will be pretty substantial. It will be non-isobaric. Non so in other words, the pressure will be varying, obviously, with the packed bed. It will not be isothermal either. So all your physical properties, such as heat capacities and so on, viscosities change along the reactor. So all those equations need to be modeled as well. Um, there will be multiple reactions occurring, not just a single reaction. So there will be reactions competing against each other in the reactor. So all of those clearly require you to use a piece of numerical software to get the solution to that reactor design. So what I thought to do in tonight's section is given the limited time in the class, we've used up 10 minutes here for the evaluation. I'll end 10 minutes early because um, I was asked by some students that they needed some time to get to their midterm. So given that limited time, what I thought I'd do is I'll take the example that I ended off with last class, which was really messy. We'll write it up on the board again. We'll work through the implementation of that in the computer software. It's going to be exactly the approach you need to take for your project. So let's take a look at that then. Last class we were looking at a membrane reactor, and what was special about it is that <coughs> the reactor's profile, this membrane allows one of the species, hydrogen, to diffuse out the membrane. So we had three components coming in, Fa naught, Fe naught, and Fc naught. So here we had A, which was butane, decomposing to B plus C. B in this case is hydrogen. Hydrogen's molecule is small enough that it can actually diffuse through the membrane. So what's diffusing out here is B. The other components, A and C, butane and but, those molecules are too large to permeate through the membrane. So we had then that Fa0 was 0.25 moles per second, and Fe0 was zero and Fc naught is zero. So we don't feed in clearly our, our two products. We're only feeding in butane. The volume of the reactor, we use this coordinate system from zero volume to capital V volume. And in this case, we have 400 liters, 0.4 meter cube. Let's work in SI all the way. Diffusing, uh, sorry, leaving the membrane is Fa, Fb and Fc at the at the end. Let's put our following aim. Aim is to find the profiles of these flows, A, B, and C, along the reactor. So A is reacting away and going to B plus C. So we should see more of we should B and C C B and C forming as we go along the reactor, but B even though it's being formed, is also diffusing out. So we're expecting to see uh, some, some interesting behavior there. So 
Let's say we would like to plot the profiles of FA, FB, FC. And I'm going to add to this, I thought this would be interesting to take a look at, and the profile of B leaving by diffusion. So the last class we said we just used without derivation because we'll look at that in 4M that the rate of diffusion of B from the membrane this is in moles per second per meter cubed is equal to K diffusion so there's this diffusion constant multiplied by the concentration of B so the higher the concentration of B the more diffuses out clearly that's correct because inside the reactor there's a certain concentration of B. Outside the reactor, there's zero concentration. So there's a concentration gradient. That gradient is proportional to the concentration of B in the reactor. The more B inside the reactor, the greater the, diffuse, the gradient, the greater the amount of diffused out. So let's plot FA, FB, FC, and RB along the reactor profile. So the last class we derived the equations for the system. Let's put them up again in the notebook, or you may refer back to your previous notes if you have them there on you. We had DFA by DB was equal to RA. We had DFB by DB is equal to RB minus capital R subscript B. So the rate of B created minus the rate of B diffusing out. And DFC by dv was equal to rc. So those are our three differential equations we're going to set up in the software. Three differential equations. Each of them requires an initial condition. fa at v equals 0 is equal to 0.25 moles per second as for the entrance there at the reactor. Fb at v equals 0 is equal to Fc, which is equal to 0 moles per second. So we don't have any flow of B and C coming into the reactor. <coughs> let's put down the rate expression. So we said, let's, let's assume we're given this information that minus Ra is equal to K times the concentration of A minus CB, CC, divided by capital KC. So that expression can be derived assuming it's an elementary reaction and using the equilibrium ideas that we looked at in the earlier class. Rate constant K, for this case, is 0 0.01 second, so minus 1. The capital KC at 500 <coughs> Kelvin, which is the temperature we're operating at, is equal to Point, uh, is equal to 50 moles per meter cubed. And this diffusion coefficient, let's assume we're given that as well, so K subscript diff is equal to 0 0.005. So it's two minus one. Let's put down some other information we know. We're going to say the diffusion coefficient versus the diffusion for the So K diffusion is the diffusion constant, it's a, it's a lumped mass transfer coefficient for species of EG. And it's a function of the material construction of the membrane. We also have, uh, we've assumed last class in our derivation that we're operating isothermally, so T is T, T0 is equal to T, and that's 500 Kelvin. We're also assuming isobaric operations, so P0 is equal to P, and that's 830600 Pascals. We also derived last class based on some work that we had done earlier that our concentrations can be expressed as C, Cj is equal to Ct0 times the flow of the J species divided by F total. So Ca, Cb, and Cc can all be expressed in that format over there. Ct0 is 
zero is equal to p zero over r t zero. And finally, the total flow is the sum of the individual flows. So F A plus F B plus F C. So that's pretty much where we were last last class, and I've just put put it all up there. So you may have this already in front of you, or you can supplement your notes from time to time. Now we're going to put it in software, and I'm going to have you two guide guide me with um, with doing that, so that we are, we're seeing how to implement this. So I'm just going to knock this down to emphasize the. So I'll do it in polymath first, and then we can look at it in MATLAB if we have some time left. Okay, so here's the, here's the idea as, you, as you've all done. You just don't go final here, let's go differential equation. What's first? This is your course project. Where the hell do you start? What do you put in here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Initial, initial conditions are? For it. Okay, that's one idea. Other ideas? Your constants. Your constants. So we've got a few things going here. Initial conditions, constants. Operating equations. Which operating equations? Uh, Ones we need to integrate. The ones we need to integrate, so my ODEs. Yeah. Okay, we're, we're trying to most convenient to start with. Constants. Constants? You all like your constants. Let's start with the ODEs. <laughs> <laughs> so so here's, the, here's the idea. The general principle of these is to start with the ODEs. How many do we have? Three ODEs. They're all in the form DFJ by DV is equal to something. This is the key key insight for MATLAB, Polymath, or Python. You put in your ODEs, and whatever's here on the right-hand side must only be a function of the ODE variables. So DFA by DV must be a function of FA, FB, and FC. Nothing else. You cannot have other terms there. If you have other terms there, you must define them in terms of FA, FB, FC. So that's the thinking you must have. All the ODEs, the left hand side, I've got FA, DFB, DFC, three independent variables, FA, FB, FC. My right hand side can only be a function of my three independent variables, uh, my three dependent variables. Okay? So right hand side <coughs> must only be a function of the dependent variables. So let's let's take a look at how we do that. Start in polymath, you can use this shortcut tool if you like, uh, which will prompt you. So DFA by DB is equal to, what's it in this case? No. <laughs> right. Okay. Initial condition for FA is 0.25. So say done. Wow. Oh, no way. No. <laughs> That's all you do, right? Okay. Next line. Okay, is that all I do? Press right. Press run. What do you do Yeah, you What's the next step? Okay, good point. And I need to find all the Okay, so here's the idea. Write your ODEs first, write their initial conditions. So here so we're looking remember we said let's have a plan for our for our for all the questions we do. The first step is we write what we know and what we don't know. That's what's here on the left and right hand side of the boards. Then we go ahead and plan our strategy. Look at my aim. This is where I want to end up. I want plots of these three dependent variables against volume. So here's my plan. Let me actually write it up for you so you, you can see it visually. 
plan for all these types of questions, including your course project, would go as follows. Write the ODEs and initial conditions. That's the first step. The second step is to sub in or write the, the knowns and unknowns. Until you have only dependent variables. And you may also have the independent variable on the right hand side. Okay, so my apologies if this is a little too small and too low. I'm just running out of space, but I do need everything that's up here on the board to stand in here. So write our ODEs and initial conditions, that's the first step. The second step is to write your knowns and unknowns down until you have only dependent variables and independent variables on the right hand side of that ODE. So right now, Polymath is pretty helpful. It's telling you exactly what your unknowns are. Right now, Polymath cannot solve because it does not know what R, A, R, B, capital R, B, and R, C are. So here's the strategy. Simply take each one at a time and write down the equation for it. So first one, go for it. Okay. Right. R, A is equal to? Try to do that, which I've sometimes done. Error in line nine. Syntax error. Please enter a valid implicit equation. So line nine, polymath tells you where your cursor is. That's line nine. I can't enter minus R A. It's on the right, on the right left hand side. So I can only do can only do um, R A is equal to something on the other side. But notice when I push enter now, that list up at the top is expanded. Okay, so now I've got a whole lot of extra work to do. Yeah, so we, we just simply work from left to right. So notice up here, I, here's a list of my undefined variables. Just hit them all one at a time. Okay, so the next step, what's the next one? Oh, So that comes from the stoichiometry. So minus RB is equal to minus, oh, RA, RB is minus RA, RC is equal to minus RA. Next one. RB is equal to CB. Okay, so here comes your favorite concept. Okay, from zero, zero. Okay, so I'm not going to type this all up. I can be in here. Okay, so we've got all those constants down. Okay, please, please note the following. Note the use of units over here. You must use SI units. If you choose to use other units, at least keep track of them, but by default you should be using SI units. It was the biggest problem in the midterm for people losing grades, was the lack of SI units. And it causes huge problems when you try to simplify very large equations. These rate expressions that you start, you'll see coming up get really messy, so let's, let's work with SI. Okay, what's the next step? CA is equal to CT0 times FA divided by FT. Okay. Oops, now I've got an extra variable. Oh, two extra variables. CT0 and FT. Let's define CB, CC. C 
EBCC, still in terms of EBFC. Okay, two more variables to go. P zero times divided by R zero times T zero. Okay, one more left. F T F A plus F B plus F C. Initial and final values are the independent differential that are not set. What's that? Q volume. Volume. So P O constant. P O is constant, yeah. So independent variable. Always set the initial and final conditions for that. So there's a third step in our plan. So again, sorry, so low down I C and F C for independent variable. Okay, so notice what we were doing there in step two. We were simply just working through the system until we got all our right-hand side only in terms of FA, FB, FC. All of that will do all the work of subbing these equations into each other. You don't have to bother, bother with that. You don't need to simplify them. All of that will sub all those equations successively into each other to get that, that very messy right-hand side working for you. Actually, it's not really doing that behind the scenes, but you can conceptually think of it as doing So the independent variable, initial conditions B0 is equal to 0. And B final, 0.4. Always put units. OK. Ready for solution. Sweet. Is that Is that mean final? Means final. It's a built-in fictitious variable. It's like you put something that's a pattern and then it will work. I've never tried it. Yeah, it doesn't know what that is. It's only F. Yeah, you can Yeah, you can zero. Okay, so let's uh, take this report off. It's always a waste of time. Uh, but let's plot the graph at least. So ready to go. It's going to use the Rondo Cutter 4 5 formulation. You can choose the different formulations you would like to, to try out. But Rondo Cutter 4 5 generally works pretty well. Okay, well done. So, I, let's just clean up here. Now, Polymath is not the most helpful. Before you get all excited and wanting to go buy the software, um, there's a number of drawbacks. One is the really painful process of working with these graphs. You have to go do this every single time. You want to change the graphs. It's a pain. Wait till your cost project and there's 28 equations in here. So then, there we go. Uh, there's our, our, our process. Our, our now, I would like to just do the following. We've done the we've done our initial process of writing down what we know, what we don't know. We've done our plan, we've implemented our plan. The next two steps are to general are to check our model and to generalize. Let's do some checking. Is this realistic? A going at 0.25 volts per, per second and decreasing down to some other value, 0.1. Why is that? A is being converted to B and C. The profile for C, the green the green one of the this line up here. Is that reasonable? Yes. Okay. B. Notice what's happening. B is being created. And then what's why is it going down while C goes up? It's confusing out. Does this profile make sense to you? It's parallel to I think that's, that's a coincidence, right? But it should be an interesting observation. I never thought of that. But. So FB makes sense because as it's, it's going through the reactor, it's at this concentration, it's diffusing out proportional to its concentration. So RB, the rate of diffusion out is proportional to the concentration of B itself. So B is going to diffuse out and get less and less and less. This is one of the whole reason why we were using a membrane reactor initially. Let's recall, in the previous class, we said this reaction 
in particular has very, very, um, it's, it's got relatively fast kinetics, but it's limited by equilibrium. Capital KC is the equilibrium concentration of C multiplied by the equilibrium concentration of B over the equilibrium concentration of A. If I want to drive this reaction over to the right-hand side, we said that one way to do that was to remove B out of the system. And that's exactly what's happening here. As I drive this reaction, take B out, I am creating more and more C. Let's take a look what would have happened if that diffusion did not take place. Okay, so let's see. If I turn that RB term off, one way I can do that is simply by your setting K diff equal to zero. Let's turn the diffusion term off and see what happens. Okay, now flow rate of B is equal to the flow rate of C, so we get one curve over here. But notice that it just simply levels off and is not at as high a value. This value of A stays out at about 0.15, whereas previously it stayed out at 0.1. So we get less A, uh, sorry, we get greater amounts of A leaving the reactor and lower amounts of B and C. So the fact that we've removed B from the reactor, we've pushed the equilibrium over to the right side. So we've actually achieved what we want to do. Very important that you go and investigate these sort of things after your problem. But don't just, don't just solve the problem and, and move on. Let's understand what's going on over here. Let me put that back there into the diffusion. And I'd like to take a look at plotting some of the other curves. I'd like to plot RB itself, so capital RB. And you can do that quite easily here in Polymath under the, just a second, I just want to go to change these axes. This is pain. <laughs> So under this, uh, this particular icon over here on the right hand side, that one that looks as follows, you can click on it and you can choose what you want to plot. So let's take FA, FB, FC off and it's plot RB. Okay, so that's the rate of diffusion out of the reactor. So initially at the start of the reactor, we've got no diffusion. The amount which diffuses peaks at about one quarter of the way into the reactor and then it, it drops off. So the greatest amount of diffusion is going to be experienced roughly in this region of the reactor. The other thing that's interesting to plot here is the concentrations themselves. So C, A, C, B, C, C. Let's look at those concentrations along the reactor. C, A, C, B, and C, C. Do those make sense? Flow rate's a function of concentration, but not directly. What's happening to FT? FT is not constant. Okay, we're going to look at FT next, what's happening to the total flow. But let's take a look at the concentrations. Concentration of A, light blue, starts at 200 moles per meter cube, drops off. Concentration of B, heats up and steady and goes down. So this is what my diffusion is proportional to. And then the concentration of C keeps going up and up. Interesting plot as well to look at is the total flow, FT. So if we go and take that out, we can go look at FT. So the total flow along my reactor is not constant. I'm getting my flow rate roughly in the middle is at a peak. I'm sorry, at about one quarter of the way through, peaks and then drops out. Again, that's due to B starting to diffuse out. So my flow ramps up pretty quickly as A, species A gets to convert it to B and C. So I've got a flow, I'm generating more flow, or generating more moles over here, as that species is decomposing. So that flow peaks up and then it, it drops off again. And then finally, interesting to plot is RA and RB and RC. So, okay, so RB and RC get superimposed on, on, on each other. No surprise that they're mirror images of each other because of this relationship here. RA is equal to minus RB. So, negative, our, our A's are negative, RB's and RC are positive. Okay. 
Okay, now if you're doing this in MATLAB and Python, um, there, there are some advantages of using polymath as, as you've probably seen here. If you do this in, in MATLAB and Python, you have to work backwards. You start with the differential equations, and essentially the process that we followed, where we were, were, were finding all those unknowns, in MATLAB and Python, you work and write your code from bottom to top, because your differential equations are the last piece of your code. And then you build up. So every line, you actually write your MATLAB and Python code going from bottom to top. Okay, so um, take, I, I posted the code for this problem on the course website. If you're going to use MATLAB and Python, please study that course, make sure you can use those two 